Ingegneri Guerra uh, is an Italian medical doctor specialized in internal medicine, holding the position of Assistant Director General for Strategic Initiatives at the World Health Organization in Geneva. He developed an intensive working experience both in high and low resources countries where he played the role of consultant and team leader for health strategies. This includes uh, UNICEF, UNDP, WHO, as well as the Italian Embassy in Washington, D.C., where he was a science and technology attaché. He ran the Office of External Relations at the President's Cabinet of the Italian National Institutes of Health in Rome and was the Director General of Preventive Health and Chief Medical Officer at the Ministry of Health of Italy before joining, joining WHO in Geneva. He contributed to many national health programs, poverty reduction strategy programs, monitoring and evaluating health activities and conducting epidemiological researches applied to health systems management. Dr. Guerra is a long time good friend of mine and I had the privilege of working with him for many years and I could appreciate his extraordinary ability to approach difficult tasks and to always find a solution to them. As I said, he is responsible for a strategic initiative at WHO, and I believe that the wellness world will represent a strategic initiative for the health and well-being of the population, and that Ranieri will be an important supporter of our initiatives. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ranieri Guerra. everybody and thank you very much Sergio for this presentation that raises a lot of expectations. My speech is going to be shorter. I come from Verona which is not in this region, not in Emilia Romagna. It's still a beautiful site. It's the Opera Valley with the Roman Amphitheater and the Opera Season in summer. It's the Love Valley founded by Juliet and Romeo centuries ago. My apologies now as I will bring you back to the ground. WHO is mostly involved in the daily fight for survival. We protect your life. We try to defeat outbreaks. We try to defeat diseases, risks, and threats. We are the invisible guardians of your life and proud to be. We are those who fight also tobacco, alcohol, junk food, sedentary life. We are those who provide water, food, sanitation, clean air, and we fight daily for that. You may not see this, but this goes back to the 50s when the first US statistician started talking about the connection between health and wellness. So it's a long time ago. As you can see, even then, at that time, he was talking about new paradigms in the world, new challenges that we need to overcome. Where does fitness, wellness, everything which is around health fit in the organization? It's everywhere and nowhere. What is WHO? WHO, as you see, is a huge organization which has organized around headquarters, regional offices, country offices. We work extensively with academia. We have more than 150 country offices around the world, not only in developing countries, but also in Europe and in North America. What is the concept, the framework of reference for the WHO? It is the Sustainable Development Goals, which have been approved by the UN General Assembly a few years ago, that frame the work of the entire UN family until 2030. We adopted, consequently, the general program of work, the acronym is GPW13, and the related budget. We are not talking about trillions of dollars, we talk about substantial amount of money which we will, we will spend in the next five years for 
protecting your life. 14 billion, actually. To do this, WHO is undergoing a major internal reform to become fit for the purpose, which is not supposed to be now. The risk of WHO is to become irrelevant in a changing world. WHO is intergovernmental. Our governance is done by countries. We have an executive board, but we have also the WHA, the World Health Assembly, which is done by 194 countries that meet and tell us what to do. Basically, what we do is to execute what countries dictate. Where we are, we do something here. Doesn't work, but you can see the green area which is saying what is aspiration of WHO to be doing in the next three to five years. To cover one billion people who are currently not offered health services. To make sure that one billion people are protected from emergencies and outbreaks. To make sure that one billion people live better. And to do this, we have organized kind of framework does it seem to be working? Kind of framework uh, that dictates where, how we will operate. The way, the way we will try to uh, make use of those tools that you can see at this side of the slide, focusing on public goods, focusing on those which are rights, basic rights for all. We will try to provide normative guidance in terms of guidelines, which are sometimes mandatory. We work on international health regulations, which are mandatory for all the countries to follow and to adopt. But we also work on uh, mandatory aspirations, like the framework on tobacco banning. We work extensively on data collection. We work extensively on the implementation of activities at country level. What are the implications? Well, the implications are many. The main implication is that we need you. We need you to tell us what to do. We need you to direct us. We need you also to align to what the big policies of the global world at the global level are. We need you to provide us with the needed information. The weakness of the Sustainable Development Goals framework is that data-wise, we have very little. And this very little is most of the time not of adequate quality for different reasons that I'm not here to discuss, but uh, you can see that out of the 244 big indicators that will tell us where the world goes and if we have success in protecting your health, very little come from the hard side we have no data in 30% of the circumstances. We have 77 indicators that are basically subjective, coming from household interviews and surveys. How do we measure success? By means of a healthy life expectancy index, which will tell us not only how many survive and for how long, but how many of these survivors do survive in the best possible way. So we will measure quality of life, not only the length of life. And we will do that by means of complex indexes that I will not describe, they are very technical. But as you can see, healthier population billion will be measured by means of lives touched by specific interventions, but also by disability adjusted life years that will be gained, hopefully, with implementation of our strategy. Talking about that, the healthier population billion in particular, we will talk about determinants of health. We will try to reduce risk factors. We will try to promote health and well-being. And well this has several implications. 
The main implication is that we will have to fight most of the time within the government side, at the public, at the highest public level. We will fight to make sure that fiscal revenues that are sometimes implicit in several non-healthy practices, such as tobacco selling, are adequately addressed. It's a nonsense in this country to get 11 billion euros per year from selling tobaccos as a revenue of the Ministry of Economics. At the same time, the health sector has to spend 25 billion per year to treat diseases and conditions caused by tobacco smoking. As you can see, the net balance for the economy of the country is negative. It's becoming more negative by the time innovative treatments become available, such as monoclonal antibodies for lung cancer. One specific issue relates to the fight against the childhood overweight and obesity outbreak, which is a worldwide trend. And to do that, we will have to improve and increase physical activity. The physical inactivity index will have to decrease by 7% in the next five years to make sure that we sustain what our, our host declared at the beginning of the conference. We have a problem, in fact. This is the prevalence of obesity around the world for adults. As you can see, the dark areas are extensively populated. These are the males, but these are the females. And as you can see, obesity is becoming a gender condition. Why is that? This is the body mass index, which predicts obesity, and as you can see, it is expanding substantially. These are the people who will become obese in the next three to five years. This is because physical inactivity is prevalent. As you can see, these are the teens who are physically inactive. These are the teens who are today physically inactive that will become tomorrow obese adults unless we stop this and we revert this. As you can see, it is still a female condition rather than a male condition. So it is very much genderized. As you can see, it is also geographically located. We know where it is, we know who are affected, we know who are at risk. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do with this? This is the fourth leading risk factor for global mortality. It accounts for 6% of deaths globally, as you can see. It is rising in many countries. It is not a condition of developed or underdeveloped or developing countries. It's a global issue, unfortunately. The prevalence of non-communicable diseases based on physical inactivity is just leading factor throughout the world. In some of the countries, it's a combination of communicable diseases, outbreaks, as well as NCDs. Cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, cancer, account for a largest proportion of global health expenditure. But physical inactivity is also associated to conditions that were unknown before we got into the picture, such as breast and colon cancer. Not only diabetes, not only ischemic heart diseases. As you can see, one quarter of breast and colon cancer are due to physical inactivity or are associated to that. The cost of physical inactivity exceeds the investment in wellness. As you can see, it's international US dollars equivalent, 54 billions in just direct healthcare services, plus an additional 14 billions that go into, that go into loss of productivity. So as you can see, the global loss in GDP 
is just huge. This is the investment case that leads us to provide some solutions. The four major killers worldwide are due to basically five main risk factors, and physical inactivity is one of them. We work extensively on decreasing tobacco use, on decreasing and controlling the harmful use of alcohol. This is the country of paradox, for instance. We are the largest in Italy, we are the largest producer of wine, at the same time we are the lowest consumer of wine, and we have the lowest pathologies associated to alcohol consumption. And finally, air pollution, which is the fifth emerging risk factor that we are trying to work on. As I said, the health sector is currently paying the bill of other sectors which are highest, higher in the, in the economic profile of different, different sectors in governments. We also work in uh, something which is usually neglected, such as mental health, which is also associated to physical inactivity. Where are we? We are, focusing, we are focusing mainly on these areas of work that, as you can see, account for almost half of the global burden of diseases. And we work extensively on individuals changing their behavior and their lifestyle, as well as on the governance, providing the physical environment that makes healthy choices easy feasible without creating challenges. It is very easy to prescribe physical movement and physical activity to children and the elderly, but if there is no physical environment around them that allows them to access gyms, that allows them to work at the school level, to exercise everywhere at the workplace, we are not serious. Going back to the income loss, as you can see, it is just worldwide, with an increasing burden in emerging countries like Russia and China, for instance, and a very consolidated trend in the Western Europe as well as in the, in the, in the US and Canada. Investment in physical movement at workplace, for instance, will benefit substantially by means of decreasing by one-third absenteeism and decreasing med medical costs the same, the same amount, as well as disability-related costs. Going very fast on what we are doing, this is the production, global action plans that will last until 2030, and if followed and fully implemented, will take us to a better world. We have established nine voluntary targets for 2025. As said, some of our guidelines are binding, some of our guidelines are just voluntary, and this is where we are now. Guidelines prescribe movement, which is, this is based on clinical evidence and on science. I'm not going to describe in details, but for you to know that we have specific guidelines for physical movement by age and gender. And that includes the 65 years old and above until the 85 years that have been shown at the beginning of the event here. Several tips to be healthy. Among them, you can see a combination of physical, spiritual well-being, fitness, capacity to use services which are made available and to access services by means of an improved health literacy in the population. This says that every dollar we invest in physical activity will have a return of three dollars, almost three dollars. Every dollar we invest in smoke cessation, for instance, will bring a benefit which is valuable, 7.5 dollars. So you can see that whatever we do from the outside will have an economic return that can be easily framed. We have some possible ways forward, which go beyond the GDP calculation for the 
well, well-being of a nation. We move from health to well-being to wellness to happiness. The Ely Foundation here has sponsored something which is quite interesting, the World Happiness Report, that I think will provide us with alternative means of measuring the progress of nations and the progress of communities, which is here. And as you can see, there is a clear skew of the curve of happiness by geography, not only by gender and by age group. So this is where we need to invest our pennies and our dollars. But also, and this is the final point of my presentation, we got to invest in the health and wellness of the planet. The emerging area of planetary health is something that we need to be aware of and where we need to focus our resources. What is planetary health? It is defined as the health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. And I underline the word, it depends. The planet-wide environmental boundaries beyond which humanity would go at its peril. And this is where we are today. Very little sense in investing in individual well-being and fitness if the environment around us is not conducive. And this is where we are now, today, with biodiversity being a kind of forgotten entity, with climate change, which is denied by some of the leading countries in the world, with biosphere integrity, which is at higher risk. I live in Switzerland. I'm benefiting from climate change. Geneva has got the most beautiful spring and summer and beginning of fall in centuries, but that's Switzerland. Small and tiny, it means nothing in the global econo economy. And these are the main contributors to the desertification and climate change of the earth. You can see that there are some surprising factors. The net contributors are obviously the largest countries, but the proportional contributors, those who contribute heavily by population, by individuals, are the Nordic countries. Is Iceland is the number one contributor to climate change. And believe it or not, this is reality and this is something that very few people know around and governments are not aware of. In conclusion, this is what we need to do. We need to move around the circle. We need to work around the areas. We need to work around this list of feasible choices, feasible activities. Public opinion, leaders like you, are critical in making sure that governments follow the healthy line. Thank you very much.